Hi everyone, this presentation covers organic molecules. Organic molecules are carbon-containing molecules. Please note there are some exceptions. There are some substances which contain carbon but are considered to be inorganic. Uh, pure carbon is considered to be inorganic. For example, diamonds are inorganic. Also, carbon oxide compounds, for example, carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, are also going to be considered inorganic. For our class, we will consider any carbon compound that will have carbon-hydrogen bonds to be an organic compound. Let's take a look at some typical properties of organic compounds compared to properties of inorganic compounds. For example, when we consider solubility, many organic compounds are not going to be soluble in water. Here, there is an exception here. If we have an organic compound which is polar, polar organic compounds will dissolve in water. For example, sugar. If you have a nonpolar organic compound, for example, a fat or an oil, these will not be water soluble. Inorganic compounds tend to be water soluble. Again, there are exceptions here, but again, uh, most inorganic compounds, for example, sodium chloride, do a good job of dissolving in water. For melting point, organic compounds typically have low melting points because to break up molecular compounds, we're either needing to break hydrogen bonds if we're talking about polar organic molecules, or we need to be breaking dispersion or London forces if we're talking about nonpolar molecules. These types of bondings tend to be much weaker, so we have lower melting points. If we want to melt an inorganic substance, we are probably talking about breaking either ionic bonds or metallic bonds, which are much stronger, uh, hence the very high melting temperatures for these types of compounds. Uh, to go along with this, again, we'll see relatively low boiling points for organic compounds, uh, relatively high melting points for inorganic compounds. Decomposition means the ability to break a compound apart when it's heated. Organic compounds tend to decompose quite easily when they're heated. Of course, there are going to be some exceptions to this. Uh, this is a general rule of thumb. For inorganic compounds, typically it requires much higher temperatures to decompose those compounds and break them apart into smaller compounds or their constituent elements. Finally, reactions with oxygen. Uh, many organic compounds are capable of combustion where they will burn and produce carbon dioxide and water. If the organic molecule contains additional atoms, for example sulfur or nitrogen, we can have the production of sulfur oxides or nitrogen oxide compounds. Inorganic compounds for the most part are not combustible. Inorganic substances, I should say, are not combustible. Typically they don't uh, burn in the presence of oxygen. Here are some examples of organic molecules. We can see that most of the bonds in these molecules are being shown. For example, here we're seeing this carbon bonding to this hydrogen. It's also bonding to an oxygen. Uh, when it's writing OH, it means that the oxygen here is actually single covalent bonded to this hydrogen. Uh, this convention does not show that bond. It is still, in fact, there. This type of convention is another way of looking at organic molecules, and I'll show on the next slide uh, what this means. These are two different representations of the same molecule, so this is the same as this, and it's the same as this also. So we see here CH3 is this carbon with three hydrogens bonded to it. The next carbon says CH2, that's this carbon with two hydrogens bonded to it, and we see that this will continue on down the line until we reach the final carbon, which again has three hydrogens bonded to it. This is a shorthand convention which is used to show this type of molecule. At the end of each line segment, here, 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 and here, we are uh, finding carbon atoms. So this point right here is this carbon, this point is this one, this point is the third carbon, here's the fourth carbon, and the fifth carbon is at the end of the chain right here. Um, now, this does not give us any information about the hydrogens. That's because it's implied. We know that carbons will always form four bonds. So if we have the carbon right here at the end of a line segment, we know it must be bonding to four other atoms. Those are the three hydrogens here. 
a carbon that's in the middle of the chain somewhere, this one, this one, or this one, we know that they're bonding to carbons on the right and the left side, so they must have two additional hydrogen atoms bonded to them. Uh, again, here we see this molecule shown one way here, another way here, and another way here. Uh, so here is the carbon at the far left side, that's right here. This carbon is this point right here. This carbon is the end of this line segment. Now we go up to this carbon here, which is double bonded to an oxygen. Uh, and then we have a carbon right down here. And then at the end of this line segment, we have an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. So at the end of every line segment, you're always going to assume that that spot is taken by a carbon, unless it's noted otherwise in the structure of the molecule.